fastest available verbal excursion to the 21st century brain. Jan's relentless verbal barrage points to the possibilities of a potential individual assault on your own personal powers that be. A symbolic romp in, around, and through the literal world. The bane of Barcalounger thinking and the enemy of the complacent neuron. Not to be taken for any kind of psychological or medical advice. All right. Ready. First off, a story. A picture. It is regarding the hiring practices of this transport company. And they need to have a position open for people to drive a truck and to move the things that they transport. And the procedure is when people show up for the job after they put out the ads and solicit that we are now hiring, then they ask the people to show up. They got a truck pulled up here to the bay door and there's this large piece of low tech, formidable, or even formidable, piece of equipment. And it's over there. It's about 150 feet away from the bay door where the truck's backed up. And the hiring man's got a clipboard and he says, all right, and he's got a stopwatch. He says, move that into the truck. And every time they do this, they have people who try everything from physically injuring themselves, trying to move this piece of equipment to people who try it and perhaps don't injure themselves, but whine, complain, and won't talk about it. The guy that always gets hired, or the guy that got hired this time, is a guy that came in and they told him the thing and he looked at it and he said, I can't move that by myself. <laughs> now, <laughs> could I point out to you that physically, emotionally, and even presently at the old level of intelligence, you've got to consider it from that level, a person being an explorer has got to know what they can and cannot move. They've got to know what is profitable and not hurt yourself physically, not even hurt yourself as it would appear to ordinary people emotionally, as illusionary as it may be from a more verbal and intellectual view. But you should not be injuring yourself, nor should you have any hesitation to be able to look at something. You don't have to announce it to anyone but yourself. And then even you may look off, but to simply announce, well, I can't move that by myself. <laughs> you have got to know which sounds simple enough and this may sound as though it's almost a good rabbinical or southern baptist truism in a short sermon to say you got to know what you can do and know your limits and know your abilities in the city that's meaningless they start religious cults and people sell books and make a reputation off not much more than that but in the city, it's meaningless to say you know your limits because people don't know their limits, people do know their limits. People know their limits and they're wrong. People don't know their limits and what they don't know is incorrect. It's a matter, you remember the rhyme, that the fact that people can't help what they do could certainly serve to debilitate you. In the city, it doesn't matter. But when you start trying to move into a new area, it does matter that you personally and this gets very tricky, as you might assume, to know that I can't move that by myself. You've got to know it. But then there's subdivisions of that. Is it necessary that this be moved vis-a-vis -vis you? Or would it just be, from your viewpoint, your individual view viewpoint, be desirable, pleasurable? That is, that apparently you want to but you're not necessarily feeling a motivation that seems to come from great cosmic forces. So you've got the two divisions. But if you indeed were trying to gain lawful employment, and they said, all right, you've got to move that into the truck. Just, that's all we can tell you. We're going to leave it to you. And the guy hits a stopwatch. So if it seems out in life that it's necessary that something be done. With ordinary people, see, it doesn't matter. 
back at you at the ordinary level to say, well, I can't move it, or I can move it. Oh, I'll go try. I know I can't, but I'll go try. And then you go try and you hurt yourself. Or you go try and you don't hurt yourself, but you try a little bit and you turn to the guy and you go, is this a trick? How much time do I have? What kind of dumb job? What, who thought up this? You can go through all of that. But you understand all of that is kind of a secondary misdirection if you look at the primary purpose if somebody wants a job. And it's not just being more intellectual. It's a combination of all of it. So it's not simply that the guy who got hired back in the story now, I'm not taking it metaphorically, uh -huh, but back in the story it is not simply the guy was all that sharp. It's not simply stating that intellectually he was the superior of guys who, they said, do you understand the problem? They said, yeah, and they hit the stopwatch. It's not that he's just intellectually superior to a guy that goes over there and tries to grab the equipment, picks it up, tries to and gets a hernia, and they have to get him to the hospital. At least he gets unemployment. Well, I don't guess he would. Well, he might. I was going to say he couldn't get workman's comp. He hadn't been hired. But at any rate, it's not simply that the guy who got hired who said, after he looked at it, and said, I can't move that by myself. It's not simply that he was more intellectual not in the ordinary sense, because you could have in the ordinary sense the archetypical intellectual, for whatever reason he's down at those kind of places looking for a job, his tenure ran out, or they caught him with that other guy's tenure about with all the girls, scouts and boy scouts and the French bread, or with that cheap motel, but here's an intellectual. Here's a guy with a PhD in physics, and he's for some reason down looking for a job. He wouldn't necessarily say, I can't move that. He might be one of the very ones, believe it or not, if you don't I hadn't already perceived this, he might be one of the very ones, some 98-pound weakling, go over there and try to pick it up and tear his back apart. The very one. So it's not simply that the guy who got hired is solely intellectually superior. He would have to have a non-verbal knowledge that he could look at the thing. So God, I told the story the way I wanted to. He didn't go over there and feel of it. He didn't go over there and rock it. He didn't try to pick it up. They told him what it was and hit the stopwatch. He looked at it and said, I can't move that by myself. He didn't waste his time. He didn't whine. He stated a fact. But it was not just intellectually. In a nonverbal, that is, a more physical manner, he nonverbally looked at it and knew, well, I can't move that. Statement of fact. It is that same sort of situation when you get above the ordinary level that only an individual can know. And it's not, of course, simply moving equipment. It is what a person can do, what you can actually expect to do, to feel what you always will, even if you're able to step into areas to where the wind, the old ordinary wind of the old world is not necessarily directly in your back. If you find places you can get step aside a little bit, you are still going to feel like the solar wind effects of whatever is going on at your time and place. That is, of something trying to push you that says, hey, this piece of equipment needs to be moved from there into the truck. <laughs> and it's this kind of thing that's sweeping over large segments of people. And you may feel it. In fact, you may have to, in some way, participate in this. It's just possible. It, that's not strange. It's back to the good old direct one to say, when it rains, it rains on everybody. Whether you've got a Ph.D. or you're a ditch digger, whether you're a Christian or a Jew, if you're all standing out there at the bus stop and it rains, you're going to get wet. Everybody's going to get wet. You can feel the kinds of urges, the kinds of needs that are going on on a larger scale with life itself, but it's not necessary that everybody that is aware that hears this message of, all right, if you're going to work, move that piece of equipment into the truck. And it's like life speaking again through this one central and it goes out and just sort of piecemeal. I'm not going to try to explain but it'd be like a random chip that sends out all these messages that life's talking and it can talk more than one thing at a time by the way as you should know when you're in five and more dimensions. Life can say a whole bunch of things all at one time continually. So some of it gets out but a lot of people, a lot of people here move this into the truck. And you may hear it, but that does not mean that you've got to go over and get a hernia. It doesn't mean that you actually have to go over there and look at it and, and make any comment, such as, I can't move that by myself. You may be aware of it, 
you may be aware then that life needs whatever life is up to with this. Life needs this. Life needs some people to go over there and hurt themselves, some people to try to move it, for people to complain about moving it. Who knows what all is going to happen? There must be other possibilities. You may be aware of that, but then you've got to be aware of this. I can't move that, and there's no need for me to get involved. Nobody's going to notice. At the ordinary level, though, when people feel that, then you're a victim of what is commonly known as the big guilt. Then people got to explain it away. People got to get into the secondary discussion of it with themselves and other people as to why they couldn't move it, or why they decided, I don't want this job, or why they decided anybody that thought up such a test as this would not be the kind of company for which I would like to be employed, and on and on and on and on. There, see, it's still not the end of it. Energy is still being churned up, even when people try to do something, and as they call it in the city, fail. That's not the end of it. The guy that went over there and got a hernia trying to pick that up, that served a purpose. For years, he may be laid up. He may never be able to work again. But he may be adding, I'm going to do this quick. You guys got to be getting good by now because it's not limited to what I'm about to say. But you got to be good, good. Let's say he could never work again. And part of his conversation is hardly a day goes by that he does not bring up verbally some way this company. Life needs that in some way. It may be a very minuscule need, but somewhere life needs all this company to keep going because I'm assuming they're still in business for him to talk about them. Let's assume that. He's laying around somewhere and he'll continue. Somebody say, I notice a stranger in the store say, I notice uh, you seem to be having back problems. Is it something I can help you with? Oh, no, I've had this for years. In fact, it's, they're still in the move up in line to pay their... He says... <laughs> He says, in fact, he turns this strange. He says, in fact, <laughs> it's unbelievable. If we got a second here. You know what happened? They tried to give me a test. I went to get a job driving a truck, being a mover, and they got me to move a piece of equipment, and I tore my back out. I've never been to work since. Can you believe that? Just trying to, applying for a job. <laughs> the guy's doing this forever, as long as he lives. Do you understand? He failed from one view. But it was serving a purpose. Energy is still being churned up vis-a-vis -vis this company and then all kinds of other things. It is not simply limited to that company. It's not limited to whoever thought up the test. It's not limited to this guy that tore up his back and talks about it at least once a day to somebody. It's none of that, specifically. But you see, omnidirectionally, and not just in the 3 and 4D sense, but omnidirectionally in ways that the ordinary intellect can't even perceive, is all of this is going on all of the time and it's only the ordinary 3D consciousness in the midst of all this maelstrom. Not in a negative sense, but in the midst of this, that must, to keep its own orientation, must continually pick out what to it seems to be something decent that happened, something appropriate that happened, something improper, something untoward, something I don't even understand, something that's just nauseous. And it's all in the midst of every possible thing, including the opposite of everything I just said. Then don't make me go back and try to remember everything I just said. <laughs> but including the opposite of all of those things are also happening. I was going to come up sometime, maybe, with a kind of mathematical or a new law and slip it in on some of you people, not maybe on the public tapes. But it had to do, I'll go ahead and say a little better, and maybe I won't have to ever do it because I almost mentioned a piece of it the last time we were taping. There's a kind of test, if you knew how to use it, and it doesn't prove anything, which is a good kind of test. <laughs> well, it does, but, but it doesn't prove anything that's on a dualistic basis. And so why I said it didn't prove anything. And that is to notice in life those things that are taken as an absolute self-evident fact by you and some other people. Not everybody, but you and maybe even the majority of people that you know. The majority of people, it seems to be your time and place. At times, once you get a little bit good, once you can pull yourself away from old world intelligence a little bit and get outside at least the earshot of Isabel and old Ferdy, you can see at times that, all right, this is taken as a truism. Might makes right. Let's use that one. But then you can say, wait a minute. There's also that, and it'll strike you as being just as valid, it's not exactly the opposite, but since I used it last time, the pen is mightier than the sword. That is, that might does not make right. It is not simply physical prowess or strength or armaments that make right. All right, so you can take something that seems to be true. Forget whether it seems to be decent, Christian, 
humane that his might makes right. You look at that and you think, by God, that's true. You know, the big fish eat the little fish. If two guys are hungry and there's one peach in the floor, the big guy's going to eat the peach. That's life. But you can turn it over and the opposite is just as true, just as valid. Not right, not wrong, not decent, not humane. This just as valid. But, wait a minute. I don't think I was going to stop at some simple-minded place like that. But there are other examples that you personally, and perhaps a large number of other people in your time and place, but that you personally, and you can feel that you are representative when you think about some other self-evident truth, and you realize that in the main, that is the general intelligence of the people this time and place, you cannot turn it over. <laughs> now, I'm not going any further with that tonight because it wasn't really what I was going to talk about. But there, it, that is a law that can prove something that doesn't prove anything. All right, I'll give you a hint before I go on. Anything in the 3D world that's true can be turned over, and it's true. And if it apparently cannot be turned over, <laughs> you may be getting close to the new world. <sighs> there was an old world philosopher, old line intelligence, a philosopher who once said, and I more or less quote, since I made him up. No, I read this. <laughs> I just, have to, I just have to clean up these people's act after all these years and going through translation because I knew what they meant to say. But the guy said this. He said that life's punishment for the wise is in them achieving knowledge while losing illusion. <laughs> I would suggest is that the core of the Faust stories throughout time and space. That is, of a guy striking a deal, however he did, and he comes up with knowledge, either through a dealing with the gods or the anti-gods, or he does it himself, but he comes up with the, quote, the knowledge of what's going on. And what it does is, once he gets it, he realizes that he has lost something. You know, I got this, I was one knowledge, and I even sold my soul to the devil or to Macy's. <laughs> but then it strikes him right, I've got it, but look what's happened. I've lost all the illusions. Now to many people with an apparently wired up turn of the intellect leaning, I'm sure throughout history have nodded, written papers on that because they teach it in college and they remember the Faustus stories, plus I can feel it down my nervous system that many people of course, many of them you could look at from an outside view if we were simple 3D psychologists and say some of that would be commonly referred to in the, at least in academic realms, as uh, SG, I guess, sour grapes. <laughs> the people that are not all that smart and always wanted to be smart, always wanted the secret knowledge and didn't get it, then went, yeah, but that's all right. At least I didn't lose my illusions because all those stories, they may be stories and myths, but I think they're telling us something. I'm probably glad that I didn't ever get enlightened or get real smart. I'm, I'm probably better off. That was real aside. The rest of it I was going to say is people with a real, ordinary, old world, intellectual bent would find great favor and nod and probably stroke their beards, if not their cat, <laughs> to hear that life will extract Especially if I made it a little more intellectual and if I said life will extract from many or from most wise men punishment in that in achieving knowledge they lose illusion. And many people go, uh huh. <laughs> too sm it might sound better if I put this in Latin if I could do it right quick, but to say something like, too smart for your own good. <laughs> At any rate, that strikes a resounding a sympathetic vibration up many people's nervous system throughout time and space. But now let me point out to a real explorer, that is all so much falderoy to be polite. 
the loss of illusion, as it is called, while gaining some sort of knowledge that the two are obviously in a kind of inverse ratio, or at least they're a linkage between the two. Somebody be sure and I bet President Reagan would be proud that I use that. <laughs> a linkage between the two. It would not be punishment to a real explorer. It would be a payoff. It's the reward, not punishment. That, well, now I've got some smarts, but Jesus, I lost all my illusions. And if that could happen to ordinary people, they say it does. It doesn't really, but you know, you know what I mean. They would go, gee, boy, what a bad break. You know, I can't return it. But to a real explorer, it would be, wow, finally. There is this. One reason I brought the story is I hit this on the run the other night. There is this that it can subtly slip up even on an explorer. <coughs> Very subtly, but it, this kind of knowledge of being able to think in ways that is so out of the ordinary, well, I keep saying that, <laughs> is that your general mode of thinking is not that dissimilar from the way I talk on these nights we take. At the times when it strikes you that, wow, that's true, that's weird, and you laugh and you chuckle, and then you leave and you can't quite get the focus back on it, but you know at the time that Jesus, that kind of knowledge can subtly slip up on people and produce a kind of, no good word, but there's something so close I just, impotence, indifference, insouciance, nonchalantness. <laughs> And it's not based on hostility, and it's not based upon the original quote, the reflection, and that quote that I gave of the world, the old world philosopher who said, being punished by achieving this new knowledge at the loss of innocence. See, that's not it. That, there's no knowledge. Faust, Goethe, the people that wrote all those stories, the people that read them and dream about it, they didn't gain some sort of knowledge by going into a deal with the devil, or a deal with mushrooms, or LSD, or with their own brain, or caffeine. It's not that. If you don't know the truth, I wasn't going into this. If you don't know the correctness, so you ought to see that. The basis of those stories in the 3D world is of them seeking this knowledge and going through either literally or mythologically or metaphorically some sort of deal of selling their soul to the devil or to God, making some great promise, and they get the secret knowledge and then feel like, well, I got cheated because I gave up my illusions. That's not it. How they felt like they got cheated is what they got wasn't shit. <laughs> pardon, me, pardon me for being technical. The knowledge they got, that they understood the deal was done. In the city, in the 3D world, you always understand that. That you made your bargain, whatever you did. You studied for years to become a priest. You went to rabbinical school for, you know, 37 lifetimes. You keep trying to straighten out your karma. You only eat one piece of brown rice every third day. Where it is, <laughs> and you chant, and you pray, whatever it is, the day comes that there's a payoff. Like you finally collapse and have to take you to the hospital and feed you intravenously, and as you're coming to, you have your awakening experience. Whatever it is, the, the day comes that you understand that this effort has gone as far as it's going, that the deal has been done, and somebody handed you the package. And they say, all right, now here's the payoff. No more fasting, quit chanting, and get a job straightened out. Here's what you get. And so they got this knowledge. But they open it up, and it's like it's an empty box. And so then they have to fill it in with a story such as, well, I got knowledge. You know, I, I almost wrecked my life, I'll admit that, and I spent a good many years working on this. But of course, not nobody ordinarily in the city is wired up to say, you know what, I just realized I wasted 32 years of my life, absolutely wasted it. <laughs> no, they open the box and it's empty, and they understand this is the end of this. But they open the box, but rather than it being empty, it's like, well, I got the knowledge, but the knowledge has its price. I should have listened to those stories. I should have read those mythological tales a, a little bit closer <laughs> because what's happened is just like that philosopher I heard about one time. I gained the knowledge, but by God, I lost my illusions. The naivete of being an ordinary human is now gone. I can never return to that kind of state, and so I'm sort of a wandering ancient mariner <laughs> on, the, on the sea of life, the turbulent sea of life. Yeah, I know what's going on now, 
but my soul is kind of disquieted because I no longer have the illusions that keep the other fools on the shore, that keep them satisfied. That kind of story. <laughs> That's not even true at that level, but I'm just giving you one way to look at how the stories come about. If you remember, it's another one of my good Kairuts I used to like, is remember, any old port in a storm. Intellectually, it has nothing to do with sailing and nautical stuff. Any old port, that is, any old story in a tide. Yeah, I believe, yeah, I didn't, yeah. So again, one of the purposes, unrecognized purposes that critics serve to artists. I've pointed out to you that they make some observation, and the artist reads it and goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I meant, yeah. A real explorer is in a new area, and it's not a matter that you have lost illusions because of gaining knowledge. The two are not linked, not in the way it's believed in the city, but it can do this, that you're in a new area, and now you understand where you left the old homeland. You understand to some degree. You understand that, hey, there it is. There's the garden. There's Eden. There's the snakes. There's sex. There's power. There's dreams. There it all is. I see it. Plus, I see how it's all connected up. I see it all. <laughs> and so, to that degree, you are experiencing a kind of freedom, but it's not freedom from illusion. It's freedom from ignorance. It's freedom from attempting to put out, stamp out, burning oil wells while wearing flippos. <laughs> It's the freedom, it's the freedom, although you need a job to look at this huge piece of equipment and they say move it and you look at it and you state as a simple matter of fact, you say I can't move that by myself. It's not freedom of, from, it's not giving up illusion that in some way has cost you something now, it is a kind of freedom, but it can almost rend you like this, that you cannot end up sitting around the bus station and finally accept, for at least for the time being or to further notice, these hard seats sitting there kind of bleakly awaiting the announcement of your call finally, the departure of your bus. But all the time you sit there and you kind of snooze, noshing on cheap chili dogs, and you just kind of sit there. You can't do that. But then if you're going to say, well, I, I, I got a fear of what you're saying, what can I do? And then I got to say, hey, have I got to tell you everything? But don't do that. Don't do that. It gets, down to the, it gets down to a kind of level that there are no real good stories for. Uh, see, I'm thinking faster trying to than I talk because I had no plans. Sisyphus, I guess, maybe getting close to it, but it's taken another way. But there are no real widespread mythological stories. There's Samson. I can do a twist on that. But what I'm getting at is people who had power of some kind and lost it, couldn't exercise it anymore, are people who had the ability to do something like Sisyphus, roll the stone up, except it was a useless task. His power was being used impotently because he'd roll it up, and then they'd blow the whistle at 5 o'clock, and he would knock off the day, and the stone rolled back down. He got the next day, and surprise, surprise, the job for the day was move it back up. There are no real stories about that I just gave you that are down into the mythological level of secondary talking intelligence and humans like my bus station because it's not based on the loss of illusion wherein you feel negative. It's not based upon fighting impossible foes and dreaming impossible dreams unless you're going to go on Broadway and take up the part of that man from you know where. It's not that. But there is a kind of area, I can go ahead and put a name on it, it is a kind of action, even sans illusion. Yeah. It is not doing the impossible, it's not doing that which may undo itself every day, but it's this that rather than sit there and dozing off and getting indigestion and getting your rump accustomed to these hard seats, living there in a bus station, other than that is to get up and do something even if apparently 
as well as you can see, even if what you see apparently is not going to have any permanent effect, it's not going to have any particular long-range effect, and it's certainly not going to have the effect that everybody else in the bus station says that it will or will not have, because they don't know. You have to go ahead and do something. And it doesn't matter much what. I'm not inferring some kind of great quest to find the grail. But just do something. It can be just your hobby. But you cannot ever fall into that, even if you didn't know the quote, but to fall in to feeling like, well, I've lost so many of my illusions. There's so many carbuncles off of my little eyes now. <laughs> I see so clearly the, and then you ought to, of course, slap yourself around and say, well, my brain suddenly went and it said this because I didn't. <laughs> but to say the kind of things like, well, now my intelligence is stuff that I realize the, uh, but then you're about to be drawn back to the old intelligence and you're going to say stuff like, the ultimate futility of this life. <laughs> Why, the impermanence of everything, even my own intelligence, even the grand deal's plans, you know, you can't do that. If you, anybody takes that for being intelligent, you belong in a bus station. <laughs> Not even a greyhound, as a matter of fact, a trailways. <laughs> there used to be a cultural hierarchy, it may be gone now, but <laughs> in the South at least. It, That is no intelligence that's, it makes my tongue quiver for me to even point out that that's no intelligence. But anybody that says that life is impermanent, that life is risky, that man's plans are prone to fail, that man's plans, even when they succeed, are prone to be undone ultimately. Anybody that says that, you'll find them on a the street corner. You'll find them next door to you. You'll find them in your underwear. They're everywhere. That's no intelligence. And to say that you know that and then do nothing, that has nothing to do with any sort of new intelligence. Let me see if I can tie this to another. I like this little story, too. It's not a story. It had to do with late 19th century courting customs, Italian style. And it went like this. I'm going to tell you beforehand, I'm going to draw a parallel between this little scenario and this kind of activity, and perhaps one other thing. But the way it went, I wasn't there, believe it or not. But the way I understand it, it went like this in this certain areas of the now nation of Italy. The couple, and you could, by the way, look at this if you can do it fast enough and along in a coeval type manner, look at it as being you and your attempt to sail away, to get to the new land, to activate new areas. But the courtship, let's go back now that pretend we're talking about that. The couple, they see one another. The beginning of the deed. Far away looks are exchanged. Secret notes are sent back and forth. Wishful glances when they pass. More notes sent. In the notes, great promises, proclamations of love, later even threats of suicide should this go awry. And then one day, it finally comes that the actual marriage, I mean, enough of this, they got to get the deed done. The way I understand it, it was once that's decided, however it happened, that their looks, finally they just realized, well, you know, enough time's passed. The deed gets done, it, then very quickly, it gets down to this, a cash transaction, no credit, and that's it. No discount for sentiment either. Not important, but I sense that not 
enough of, or not as many of you <laughs> as I expected, enjoyed that as thoroughly as I did. <laughs> now back to this sort of thing. Can you see a real, real parallel to that? You could even see it in the 3D world. I'm not trying to make this to be too pseudo-mystical. If we're just talking about regular 3D activities, which are going nowhere, 3D intelligence, you could see that that happens to people in life, back in the city, back in the old world, just with ordinary pursuits, their dreams, their aspirations of what they may do, of looking at catalogs of Harvard, maybe even driving up and drive past Harvard, and then maybe looking down at the LSATs the last time they took it. Then they may send notes to the president, to the admissions office, for claiming their love. They may even threaten. You know, if I don't get admitted, I'll do something horrible. I'll either shoot myself or I'll go to Princeton. <laughs> but, beyond the 3D world, can you see that every person, because you can't escape it to some degree, even in the ordinary world, but in this, it is in the beginning, no matter how close you try to get to it, in the beginning, you've got to understand that, or you should see it after the fact now, that it is like some kind of affection, or perhaps affection, some kind of attraction. You're not quite sure. It's like the guy walking down the street in this little Italian town, and looks up in a balcony, and there's this girl looking out, you know, half of her face hidden behind a curtain, and she looks, and he glances. And it's these good old Hollywood type. That suddenly, I think I'm in love. I think. I think I'm in love. That face. And he just sees it for a second, and she... You can get exposed. Do a book, do your imagination. Well, it'd have to be a book because you've got to hear it described before you <laughs> remember. But you hear about what you think this is, and you get a glance of it, or you think maybe you do, or maybe you thought you'd get a glance in a book, or maybe you talked to somebody, and they went, yeah, I met a strange guy one time. And it's like, this is it, this is it. And then you go through this process, though, that it's kind of a silent and it's a distant exchange of looks, maybe subtle body movements. Then in a sense you start sending notes. You make all kinds of promises. Proclaim your love. Even make threats, suicidal threats. The day will come though. The day will come that the deed's got to be done. And then after all of this, It is exactly, not parallel, it's exactly like the culmination of that courtship scenario. <laughs> it gets down to, all right, let's do it. And it's like the bride and the groom, or the groom and the bride's father. All that's unimportant. It's the two forces representing the hope for our mingling, the marriage coming up. It gets there, forget all these glances, forget all these peeping behind, winking over little fans, slipping notes, walking past late at night, whistling up at the window. Forget all that, Charlie. It's cash. No credit. No credit, period. If the marriage, if the merging is going to be done, it is cash on the barrel held now. No credit extended to anybody. No discount made for past promises, hopes, threats, dreams. Sentiment counts for no credit. None. Do you understand? It goes from all sorts of, that's why I kept dragging it out of the glances, the whispers, the notes, the dreams, the pining, the yearning. When it gets down to it, you're going to find out it's all right. It's time. And nobody is prepared for this. And nobody necessarily uses these terms for what they want is immediately. They want credit. They want to give a post-dated check. <laughs> they want a discount. They want anything except what it amounts to. And what it amounts to is this. It's a cash-only transaction when the time comes. And there you stand. You reach for credit cards. <laughs> you reach for your checkbook. And I mean, it happens this fast. It's really fast, and I can tell you. And you try all that, the things that you'd normally expect, and you do understand. I hate to tell you. I'll admit it. I'm talking metaphorically now. We're talking... Tropics, what are tropics? 
and you find out it is cash on the barrel head now. Not, can I go cash a check? Can I go down the automatic teller? It's now, now, and it's over about that quick. But notice, whether I'm not talking about that, which I could be, or this Italian courtship, that the guy finally is ready to strike the deal, and he understands the way that Italians can, and sort of an Italian type system, that all right, it's enough of this, and he goes to get the marriage done to her, her mother, her father, all that's not important. He goes, he's one for us, he goes, all right, let's do it, enough of that. And he finds out right then, all the participants do, but he finds out, okay, it's cash right then. We'll close it out, it's such and such. And he immediately, everybody, you think, and you reach for her, but at least you think, checkbook, credit card, how much? Because no one's ever prepared. And as soon as they hear it, but in the city, that is the kind of secondary dragging out, churning up of one's account, that even if the guy goes, uh, uh, and the father says, I forget it. I'm not going to let her marry somebody like you. And he grabs her and leaves, and that's the end of it, as far as that marriage went. But he now, maybe, will at a bar meet the guy that tore his back up trying to move that piece of equipment. <laughs> and so this guy can be talking about that company that made him ruin his back, and this guy can listen to that guy's story and say, bring us two more beers. And he says, you think that's something? Let me tell you, I didn't, I didn't tear my back. I tore my soul. I was in love, and I couldn't come up with the cash to do the deal. So he can talk about that the rest of his life. So in fact, it's not really over. We've got to turn the tape over. Those of you on tape, this is the third taping of the week, which is our short night. So I'll... I'm going to wrap up this paragraph and leave it with you that I was pointing out something that is reported as a historical phenomenon that is that courtship and I want you to understand about the quickness the abruptness that once the dancing which wasn't even the main dance it was like the pirouetting around it's like the wandering around the edge of the dance floor around the gym and you're not sure yet that you want to ask the girl to dance when it comes time, you only got like that. This is not any kind of threat, or I'm not trying to scare anybody in some sort of weird way, but I'm telling you, when the time comes, you got to turn around the girl, and you've been fooling around here for an hour, trying to get the nerve to ask her to dance, or maybe even thinking like she's going along with it, and you may even believe that once I get up and ask her to dance, there's no doubt she's going to say, yeah, because I've sent her notes, and I keep looking on my shoulder, and she smiles, and I smile, but then you get to say, let's dance, and you find out it's a cash transaction. Right then. In this sort of activity, and I don't mean that this is just a one-time deal either, because there's not just one girl in the world, and there's not just one instance. I'm not trying to make this out that you're going, if this happens and you don't have the money, you've blown it forever. I'm not saying that. But when it happens, it is right then. It is absolutely sans froid. It is cold-blooded even to the French. <laughs> cold-blooded. And there are no discounts. The girl will not say. She will not respond to you saying, well, you know, that you complain about the price. So you just hesitate, which is all you got to do because that's registering a complaint. Did you find it's a cash transaction to dance? And you hesitate as opposed to immediately paying the price. And you... <laughs> And what you're doing, now forget all this dancing in the courtship and forget, of course, money literally. But there you stand and you're continually going to be faced with this that you can step out across the Ohio or the Mississippi or you can go ahead and step on the Nina and begin sailing away from Spain like you said you wanted to. But every time you hesitate, what you're doing, now back to the parallel of the courtship, what you're doing is saying, uh, could I have some credit? See, because you have credit, on the basis of that, if somebody like extends you credit, you may not ever pay for the thing. Or you can break it. Or you can get it and open it up and decide, I don't really like that. I just won't pay. You want credit. Everybody wants credit. Now remember, we're not talking about money. Everybody wants credit. And what they want is credit for what I've already done. All right. All right. All right. I also want credit. Now, I know, you're right. I hadn't done a lot to deserve this, maybe. But wait a minute. 
what I also want is credit for everything I thought about doing. Because, boy, I thought about this a lot. And I thought about all the stuff I could have done or maybe should have done. And I want some kind of credit because that amounts to something. And I'm telling you, when you say, let's dance, or you tell a guy, I want to marry your daughter, or you tell her I want to get married, and immediately you're going to hear. It's going to come back to some of you. You're going to realize. You're not going to hear it in these words, but you're going to hear, all right, Charlie, cash only. And all it's going to take is you go, and that's it. Because you're asking for credit. You're asking for a discount. But you're asking for some sort of credit for everything that you've thought about, everything that you dreamed about, and it's cash on the barrel head, and it's now. The girl will not let you walk away. The father will not let you. You cannot say, well, all right, I understand cash. Didn't bring it. Go to the teller and be right back. He won't be there. She won't be there. You cannot do it. Do any of you hear any of this? We're not talking about money. But when you realize it's cash on the barrel head, no credit, no credit, and you hesitate, you're asking for credit. You're asking for a discount. What you're saying is, I cannot pay the price. Even if it apparently is extremely reasonable, <laughs> Such as, all right, I didn't bring any cash, but I understand. I'll pay it. I gotta go get. I, I, I gotta run down and get some money. It's over. That one episode's over. You cannot go. It's then, 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 and it's cash only. No credit. No discount. And certainly, I shouldn't even have to point this out. There is no bargaining. And it's over just about like that. That it's announced, and you'll realize, all right. Okay, we'll dance. It's cash now on the barrel head. And you go, it's gone. It is gone. Nothing to be disappointed about. No kind of attempted scare tactic to anybody. Now I suggest that you try and chew and think and remember that for a little bit. Because some of you thought maybe that you didn't hear it. Everybody heard it. <laughs> I want to grab a couple of pieces from the last time we taped. I was talking about the possible ultimate triumph of talk. Uh, lots of you reacted to that in numerous ways, but I didn't drag out any real great examples at that time. So they're going to leave it with you here for the 48 hours or so. But let me be very specific. This is not the end of it. I'm not trying to ground it out for you and to bring it down to some sort of verbal cul-de-sac. But I want to be sure that all of you understand that this is not far-fetched. It is not theoretical. It is not in some way beyond the everyday realm of the quiet, mundane material world. It's just not recognized as such. The instances, such as might makes right, or if it doesn't make right, how about this? To, to fly in the face of me saying that, that it's possible that talk, that the, there'll be an ultimate triumph of talk, a big guy goes up to a little guy and kills him without any comment, for whatever reason. Make up your own story. But this guy he goes over and he kills the guy. No comment. He doesn't make any... Perhaps the victim, just when he started to realize he was about to die, he may have even tried to talk. He may have said, please don't kill me. The guy killed him. The ultimate possible, ultimate triumph of talk. How about this, though? Somewhere in that same kind of scenario, under most circumstances, you're going to be faced with this. Very likely. The man with no comment who killed this other guy, the little guy, is now at some future time he's standing and there's this guy perhaps in a different time era, could have been wearing a powdered wig and has gone through a certain dances and they've been going through this little procedure and the guy says, guilty, 
and that one word sends him out in the yard with 15 or 12 strangers who have these mechanisms that fire these little pieces of lead. One word is the end of him. So the guy who non-verbally, the big guy who killed the little guy, eventually <laughs> has destroyed himself by talk. Madam Foreman, you reach a verdict. Yes, guilty. The judge says, death at dawn. Well, they all go to dinner. That's the end of it. He goes out, maybe has a snack. They wake him up nice early in the morning so that you know, he's there to be shot. You can see that there is a kind of ultimate triumph possible in talk. You can even look at civilization, just to use the ordinary term. The life, which when I say ordinary term, to remind of you people have seen this on tape at other times and other places, civilization can be seen as simply in its various forms, and it doesn't matter what the forms are from place to place. But civilization is, in time and space, when the verbal part of the human nervous system is now of central significance. That is, you have set up the possibility, whether you can see it right now or whether it seems to happen in your lifetime, in your view, you have set up the situation wherein civilization can be seen as the manifestation of the ultimate triumph of talk. <laughs> let, me soften the, let me soften the picture of the man killing somebody and then the words triumphing, triumphing over him, ultimately, that is, guilty as charged, guilty of murder, uh, sentence, death. Words did him in. But let me soften it a little bit. Sure, a lot of you have heard such stories. If you hadn't, they do happen. Uh, let's take an area that would seem to be less civilized. Still civilized because they can talk. But let us move in time and our space. And we're at some less civilized, more simplistic era and area. And some man in the village transgresses the village code in a manner such that the judge there or the head man decides he must be punished and his punishment they don't kill him they silence him that is everybody in the village quits talking to him do you know that under the proper conditions and not anything all that strange it's just going to be the proper time and proper place that can literally be a death sentence that the guy stays there in the village, he got nowhere else to go, let's assume, and everybody else continues their life as it was, but now no one ever again speaks to that man in a fairly soon time frame, the man will lay down in a very short period of time, get sick, and die. He was sentenced to death via a kind of ultimate triumph of talk, the withholding of talk from the man will kill him. And if any of you have nervous systems that want to rebel against that, how about let's move up to somewhere back in the middle or closer to the other end, put somebody in solitary confinement in a more civilized area. We don't believe in that kind of voodoo stuff. But that guy has been so much trouble. His original crimes are so heinous and he has been such a troublemaker since we had him. Go put him in the hole. And they leave the guy down there for months or a couple of years. Nobody ever speaks to him. They slide a little food under there and he tries to talk. Nothing. You do know, under more even apparently civilized conditions wherein people don't believe in voodoo, that the guy might as well be dead. It'll drive him absolutely bonkers. He, in essence, is brain dead. He's mind dead. He's civilized dead. Through an ultimate triumph of talk. The lack of it. Would anybody suspect that there was any pertinence individually and practically to that? I certainly hope not because you're going to drive yourself bonkers. So I just thought of that and it just sort of had to come out. But I'm, I'm sure it has no significance whatsoever. 
unless any of you people happen to talk to yourself or unless some of you people believe that you carry on internal conversations with somebody or well or some of you believe that you what do you call it uh, think think if some of you th believe think you think but other than those few exceptions the rest of you don't don't look for any sort of possible pertinence to that all right and one other I wanted to touch on <coughs> I was concluding the last time we taped about another tool that I was going to give you. And I gave one version, and it was kind of soft. There is a harder version. And so I think I'll conclude tonight for those of you who've had 48 hours to mull it, maybe do a few push-ups, get a good night's sleep. The tool, there's another version. And there is a difference for those that can hear it. The tool, instead of ever saying that I think, the hard version is <laughs> and then my brain went. See, I gave you the mind. That was the soft version. And I also want to be sure I had some fear after it was all over. When I say went, to all you people at other times and other places, I'm using went as a colloquial synonym for said. I just don't want to say said. But it's sort of a, well, the rest of the country, you people should know that. You may exposed to the Beverly Hillbillies and educational TV enough. <laughs> Instead of saying to yourself even that, well, I considered the matter and then I thought, don't ever do that. So, well, I heard somebody talking about that, and uh, I, I heard him say it, and before I knew it, my brain went, and then whatever it was that you would normally, that other people would say, well, I thought, forget all that, you didn't think that. You were staying around, and suddenly your brain went, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it may have done it out loud to somebody else. <laughs> I'm not going to suggest that you necessarily cue in or even attempt to cue in the rest of the public by telling them in some way that, well, what I told you, I didn't really think that. I know we're talking. I was listening to what you said. And I know, I know what you think. I said, if I didn't say that, you got through to explain that, and suddenly my brain went, blah, 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 and I just did it. I'm not saying that you should tell people that. But in case you do, if it doesn't work, I'll also always remember that you can supercharge it, that if they don't buy that, say, well, all right. Is after I heard what you said, then my brother's brain went. <laughs> <laughs>